the only vestige of Havdalah that was salvaged tonight is the bracha of Bayre Me'ore Ha'esh. The Bayre Mine B'Samim, which is Menachemas, which revives the Neshama, which represents the Chush HaReyach, the Chush of Tchil Samesim, is not available to us tonight. The Bayre Pri HaGafen, which represents the Yayin HaMeshumar, the wine of La'asid Lavoi that the Rabbani Shalaylam has preserved from prior to Chet Eitz Hadas is not available to us tonight. But the only aspect of Havdalah that we were able to fulfill tonight is the Bayre Ma'ayre Ha'esh. Why do we make a Bayre Ma'ayre Ha'esh on the Tzoy Shabbos? Adam Arishain sinned by the Eitz Hadas prior to Shabbos. As the case is in regard to all of our tithes, we would only wait for HaKadosh Baruch Hu's timetable, we could have it the Heter. Had Adam Arishain waited until, until Shabbos, it would have been permissible to him, it would have been muttered to him. Adam Arishain did not wait, as a result he is thrown out of Gan Eden. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu did not want to throw him out of Gan Eden on Shabbos, so the Rabbani Shalom waited until Metzai Shabbos. Metzai Shabbos, Adam Arishain was flung out of Gan Eden, out of a world of light, a world of no pain, a world of no death, a world of people that don't have to endure fear and the struggles for life. And Adam Arishain is cast into a darkness that neither he or the world the young, fledging world had ever experienced until that time. And the split second that Adam Arishan saw that darkness and had to deal with the guilt that he is the one that brought, apart, brought upon the world this darkness, he was about to give up. However, he decided that it must be that a Kaddish Baruch Hu created a world where one can endure even in darkness. And therefore he rubbed two sticks together, Kaddish Baruch Hu gave him the das to do that, and suddenly he was taken aback as a fire appeared, a light appeared. Even in death, even in darkness, even in a world that is so cursed, a world where people go and kill others and murder others and terrorists across the globe are glorified in this world, you can light a light a world where people are suffering so much, tossing and turning in hospital beds, young mothers, young fathers, young children, people dealing with the unknown. In this world, you can light a light, you can turn, rub two sticks together and create a fire. In other words, even in darkness, life goes on. And at that moment, Adam Marisha knew that Gaulus is going to be long and difficult, but that we are going to endure and therefore we make a Bairi Ma'ayre Ha'esh HaMetzai Shabbos. And that Bairi Ma'ayre Ha'esh burns even on Tisha B'Av. Ignak is marching in the death marches. He had survived the concentration camps until now. And he knew it was only a matter of time before he would be liberated either by the British or the Americans or the Russians. But the, the Germans instead of running for their lives, felt it was more important to try to kill Jews. And he is marching and marching and marching day after day after day. Not a drop of water, not a drop of food. And the sun mercilessly bakes down on Ignat's head. To his right and to his left, people are falling. And the price for falling, the price for fainting, was death. At one point, they march along the Dambe River, the river, the water is so cool, so thirsty. They plead and beg with the Germans, can we, can we stop for a moment to rest, to perhaps wet our parched lips? No, they say. If you go into the water, we will shoot you. You see, because we're so concerned, they laugh, that you're going to drown. You don't know how to swim. So we'll have to shoot you if you go into the water. As they continued to march on and more and more people collapsed, the Germans were upset. They wanted to be the ones who decide who lives and who dies. How is it that there's another force that determines 
So therefore they decided that those that were struggling to march on, those that were falling, would have to be helped. And the way that would be helped is anyone that could continue to walk would have to now carry somebody else on his back. Ignak now had to carry someone on his back. He ordered his feet to keep on marching. He knew that the second his feet stopped, he and the person on top of him, his human cargo, would go up to Shemayim as Chavrusas. If it happens, it happens. But I have to continue to march. With Kaiches that are beyond human, with power that is beyond imagination, they reach the infamous gates of Mauthausen. They go from the frying pan to the fire. Hard to make a Shechianu for arriving from one death march to a death camp. But Ignat says it does not make sense of Piderech HaTeva that he was able to endure that march with someone on top of him. It must be. It must be that a Kaddish Baruch Hu wants him to live. And the same Kaddish Baruch Hu who saved him in the camp still now, and the same Rabbi Shalom who gave him the power to march, is going to give him the power to endure a Gehenim called Mauthausen. Right there and then there's a selection. An Ignak, a veteran, watches the eye of the German, Yimach Shemai, who is doing the selection. It's very clear to him that it's not skilled labor that's going to be the license to life, but rather a few pounds of flesh. That was what you needed to stay alive. And Ignak looked at the hollow pit that used to be his stomach, and he realized that he does not have that license to live. The German was going from person to person, took out those that didn't have flesh left, and asked them for their concentration camp number. Ignak realized once he gives him the number, he's doomed. He began to think. He began to think and suddenly he had an idea that flashed through his mind. He began to jump up and down to try to rub some color into his face. And when he asked him his number, he told him a number that was not his real number. A few moments later, a truck pulled up. And all those who were set to the side, they called their number and they were told to walk onto that truck. Those that were walking to the truck were walking in a daze. They knew it would be their last march in this world. And then they called out number 7327, and no one responded. 7327 yelled the angry German, and no one responded. They began to run from person to person. They asked every single person their number. He ran to Ignac and asked him his number. Not 7327. They didn't know what was going on over here. Another German walked up, looked at the list of numbers and said, someone gave you the wrong number. But who was it? At this moment, the German was so embarrassed that someone was able to do that, he just told everyone to proceed. Those to death, death, and those to slave labor, slave labor. <laughs> Ignat had survived another round of death. That night, as he fell asleep in Mauthausen, and the others warned him, don't even dream to survive, he dared to dream. In his dream, he saw his Zayda, the Dalna Rabbit of Asher Zaylig Greenswag. And they were, they were sitting by Shalashudas in a different world. And his Baba was bringing out some hot cakes, putting it down. And there was coffee. And there was the Zmirais, Nizmah David. And his grandfather turned to him and said, Remember, one who was careful of Shalash Su'udais is saved from the Muhammad of Goigu Magaig, from the wars that are going to take place before Mashiach comes. If you will be careful of Shalash Su'udais, you will survive. Ignak awoke from the dream. The next night, he had the dream again. He was determined to eat Shalash Su'udais in Madhausen. From the one piece of bread that he had for an entire day of slave labor, a rotten old black piece of bread that was mixed with sawdust, he took off one crumb and kept it in his pocket. That night as his stomach growled for hunger and whatever was left clinging his neshama to his goof, whatever that connection was pleaded for life, Ignak wanted to eat that crumb so badly. And the next night he wanted to eat the two crumbs. And the next night the three crumbs, but he didn't. He held out until Shalashudas. 
And then he sat down in a little corner, knowing good and well that if a kappa would catch him, it would cost him his life. He would slowly chew these six crumbs. Every single night, Ignat had the dream again. It got to a certain point with the dream about his grandfather telling him if someone eats Shalash Sudas, he's going to be saved. From the Muhammad of Gagumagag became a reality. And the camp became a dream. On May 6, 1945, the American army liberated Mauthausen. Ignak was liberated. Why is it that the Suda of Shalashuda saves us from the wars of Goig Umagard? The Suda of Shalashuda corresponds to Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu is the Bchir Sheva Avais. He is the one that gave us Tfilas Ma'ariv. By Yivga Bamokain. Yaakov Avinu has to build Cloud Israel. He's been robbed. He doesn't have a red cent to his name. He lost everything and anything. He has to deal with the most treacherous person in the world. By Yivga Bamokain, he hits a brick wall, as I state in the Medrash. Yaakov Avinu, for the first time in his life, who endured all of the difficulties till then, faces a brick wall. And he says, I can't pass this wall. There's no place for me to go. I can't go on with life. I can't survive. It's impossible. I'm not going to be able to do this. And if he was looking forward to that mincha and cry his heart out, even that mincha was taken away from him as the sun set prematurely. And he could no longer die. Instead of giving up, Yaakov Avinu was Mesachan and Nutfila, Marif. The Tfila of even when all else fails, the tefillah of when everyone says there is no hope, the tefillah of when everyone predicts doom and gloom and there's no reason to go on with life. There's a brick wall ahead of you, there is no place to go. Yaakov Avinu is Misaka in tefillah's mariv. And he says, just because I only see a brick wall in front of me, doesn't mean that life cannot go on. And that is why the Suda of Yaakov Avinu is the Suda of the Muhammad of Gaigu Magad. Because we live today in a world where Al-Hidera Chateva, the situation is all gloom and doom. Europe may be a generation away from a Muslim majority. Iran sharpening its teeth day by day, hour by hour, second by second. And a world that is doing absolutely nothing Reports of anti-Semitism streaming and steaming higher and higher. As one professor in Harvard not a while ago said, what's going to be so bad if Iran gets its way? Think about how the world will be so much better politically for the West if Sineim Shal Yisrael indeed is wiped off the map. This is the thinking of not someone in a bar or a tavern, but of the intellectia of the world. In this world, as we try to endure, in this world, as we try to survive, by Yiv Gabamokim with a brick wall ahead of us, Yaakov Avinu says, For you there is Tfilas Marif. In Shulchan Aruch it says that although every single year there's a Sudas of Sekes that is extremely limited, you have to sit down. And you can only eat Shnei Tavshilin. And you can't then Shemizumin. So we are told that this Suda that we just ate can be even a Suda Shloyma B'Shatai. Even the Suda of Shloyma HaMelech in his lifetime. Chazal don't use metaphors easily. Shulchan Aruch doesn't use Mishalim easily. As I heard from my Meshgiach Lazayin Gezunt, if Chazal say that the Shalashudas that leads into Tishavav is the Suda of Shloyme B'Shata, of King Shloyme during his time, then that requires further analyzation. Shloyme Amelech was the 15th ruler, Sahara B'Shleimusa. In his time, it was a perfect world. It was in the end of what's going to be when Mashiach is going to come. Shloyme had the respect and the command and the power of the world. Shloyme HaMelech could have rested on his laurels and just enjoyed the ride. Instead, Shloyme HaMelech Baruch Kachai saw there's going to be a difficult gallus. He saw a Spanish Inquisition. He saw people climbing into dark holes to light Shabbos candles. 
He saw people being tortured to death, not to give anything away. Shloim HaMelech saw. He saw the crusades. He saw the sheer horrors of huge communities going up in flames. Shloim HaMelech saw the Nazis. He saw a woman in the Warsaw ghetto walking with her two children. Only moments before she shielded the eyes of those children, they shouldn't see her husband collapse in hunger and die. And a German truck pulls up. And everyone knew what that truck was. In that truck, the Germans just piled children in. And then they took the exhaust pipe, hermetically sealed the truck, and took the exhaust pipe and pointed it back into the truck so that the children should not survive the ride as the, they would be poisoned by the gases. The German jumps out and grabs her two children and throws them into the back of the truck. The woman goes mad. She runs in front of the truck, climbs up on the hood, and begins to pound at the window. Others are trying to call for her. Why die when you're so young? Maybe you have a chance to survive. They try to coax her off the truck. Don't you realize the SS officer is going to run you over? Don't you realize he's going to crush you and kill you at this moment? She pleads and bangs on the windshield of the truck. The driver gets out, and people close their eyes and turn away. Why do they have to watch as he pulls out his revolver and kills his mother? Instead, the German tips his hat and says, Frau so-and-so, how can I help you? And she begins to cry, my children, my children. And the people couldn't believe it. Could it be that there was some compassion in this Nazi's heart, an oxymoron, a contradiction of the worst order? For he told her, oh, I can only imagine what you feel like. And he walks to the back of the truck, and he opens up the door. And the two children begin to clamor to get out and cry for their mother. And the German, with the most sweetest smile, turns to her and says, Pick one of your children. The other one has to stay and die. She begins to cry and plead. He says, I give you 30 seconds. She said, You pick. No, no, madam. Courtesy. You get to pick which one of your children. She reaches for one. The other one cries, Mama. She reaches for the other. The other one cries, Mama. The German says, In 10 seconds, if you don't pick, both die. In desperation, she closes her eyes, reaches, and pulls out one of them. The German laughs, slams the truck, and drives away. The woman goes mad, screaming. Had she not just killed her own son? Is this perhaps the kavan of Yirmiyo Hanavi when he said, Nashim Rachmaniyais Bishlu Yaldeyen? She goes mad. In her madness, she begins to beat the surviving son. They have to run and take it away from her. Shlomo HaMelech looks into the future, and he sees all of this. And he says, I should rest, be happy. Don't I see there's going to be a gullus? And Shleim HaMelech does everything within his power to try to avoid that gullus. And he does so at the expense of his own Olam Haba, which he was willing to sacrifice. And as Chazal tell us, he almost lost. He marries a thousand princesses from all the different nations, hoping that this would take away the necessitation for gullus. If only the princesses of all these different nations will hear that there is a Bayri Aylam on the world, that whatever tikkun is necessary by hidden being on all four corners of the world is going to be done, is going to be accomplished. Ashloim Melech marries Bas Parai, which was the strongest klipa and the strongest tumma. And the wedding coincides with the night of the building of the base of Migdash. Nashim Hitu Shloim HaMelech would not be successful, but he was willing to give everything up. When Shloim HaMelech had to build the Beis HaMikdash, he could not build the Beis HaMikdash, because he had no way of cutting the bricks. And it is also to use a sword, or any type of metal, or a saw, to cut for the Beis HaMikdash. Because what is a sword? A sword means you're in my way, I will strike you down. A sword means there's no such thing as a brick or a wall in my way. I'll just cut it in half and storm right through. The Beis HaMikdash teaches us that you have to wait for the Rabbeinu Shalai to take you through. You cannot destroy. So Shloim HaMelech knows the only way to build the Beis HaMikdash is with a worm called the Shamir worm. 
He does not know how to get it. He sends Ben Yahu Ben Yahyada, and they trap Ashmedai, the king of the Shadim, and he reveals to him that a certain type of bird has the Shamir worm. And Shlomo Melech sends, doesn't say, it's not clear from the Gemara who he sent, but he sends someone to get it, and he tells them how to do it. They find the nest of this bird, they put a piece of glass over it, the bird comes back, can't get to its children, runs to retrieve the Shamir worm, so that the glass should split. At that moment, the bird is scared away, and the Shamir is taken to be brought to Shlomo Melech to build the base of Migdash. When the bird saw that the worm fell into human hands, the bird committed suicide, for the bird was entrusted to watch the worm. What is so frightening about this worm? I once heard someone suggest, I don't know if there's validity to it, but I think that the attitude or the thought behind it is real. Could it possibly be that the union of something being split in half refers to the splitting of the atom? Does it refer to nuclear bombs? Does it refer to the secret of how the entire world lies in the mercy of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and it is slowly spinning out of control? Is that what it means that when the bird said it fell into human hands, it's going to be destroyed? Is it going to be that at the last split second, when scientifically and sociologically, and anyone that predicts the nature of wars and how countries are preparing, say that the world cannot exist much longer, it is, that, is it that last split second that the Shamir, that the splitting of the atom is taken away from a power of destruction and instead is used in the building of the Beis HaMikdash? Perhaps. Shloyna HaMelech, after succeeding in building the Beis HaMikdash, does not release Ashmedai. Why doesn't he release Ashmedai? Perhaps he was curious. But perhaps there was a deeper meaning. And he says to Ashmedai, tell me, where's your great power? He says, unshackle my chains which are tied by the Shem of Ayin, and I will show you. And when Shloyma opens it up, Ashmedai grabs Shloyma Melech and throws him so far. He's so far away from Yerushalayim, no one even knows where Yerushalayim is. And Ashmedai assumes the role of Shloyma Melech. Shloyma Melech's life for all practical purposes is over. He begins to wander like a pauper and he asks someone, where's Yerushalayim? And he is so far away, the person never even heard of Yerushalayim. A remnant to what's going to be in the future. Where we are so far from the imtidbak l'shoyni l'chiki meshchachach Yerushalayim, we don't even think about Yerushalayim. Yet Shloyme does not give up. Shloyme was melech al makloy, the Gemara says. All he, a second before, he was king over the entire world. And a second later, he's king over his stick says the Katska that's not meant in a derogatory way. It's meant in the great courage of Shloyma HaMelech. He says, Rabbi Hashem, you gave me Yerushalayim, you gave me power over the Kaiches and the Oifais, I am king over the power of the Kaiches and Oifais. And if all I have left is with my stick, I will not fall into a depression. I will be king over my stick. The wife that Shloyma had, Naama, that out of her would come Malchus base David, would come Mashiach, was a woman that he met, says the Chida from a Medrish, a woman that he met when Shloimek had to take a job as a waiter, and it looked like his life was over, he would never get back to Yishalayim. And she was Mechazikim and said, I want to marry you, life is going to go on. And later on, they had no food, they had nothing, and he caught a fish to try to cook Lekavit Shabbos, and he found the ring that Ashwadai threw in, and as a result, he works his way back to Yishalayim. Why did Shloyma hold on to Ashmedai? Why didn't he release him right away the first second once he got the Shami worm? It's because when Shloyma built the Beis Amikdash, he was pained beyond imagination when he knew that it's not going to last forever. When Shloyma built the Beis Amikdash, he built subterranean tunnels and chambers to hide the Arain, where according to at least one sheet in the Gemara, the Arain is there to this very day, to this very moment. That famous story where someone came and brought down in the book all for the boss, where someone came to the Chafetz Chaim and told him about a story about someone in Eretz Yisrael who was digging deep, deep somewhere in the Yerushalayim and perhaps found a tunnel and followed the tunnel and saw a light that was beyond his imagination. No one going to the whole story and the Chafetz Chaim said, don't reveal this. 
in my lifetime and make sure no one knows where that is. Shlaima prepared the world for Geula. The reason Shlaima didn't want to let Ashmedai go is he hoped. He hoped that the head demon in the world could somehow reveal to him what the power of Golis is and that Shlaima could diminish it. And all of his life he spent so we shouldn't suffer when he could have lived the way he lived. And that is why the Suda of Shabbos leading into Tisha B'av is the Suda of Shlaima Bishata. It's the Suda of when things are going very good in Golis, remember you are in Golis. That Shlaima HaMelech who never forgot it for one moment, never sank into the first class life that he lived and said, why should I think about someone else's Tsaris? He risked his very Metzias, the Gashmias, the Beruchnias for us to survive. And that is why it is the Suda Shlaima Bishate, which is the Suda of Shalash Suda. It's the Suda that saves us from the Muhammad of Goig Umagai, particularly when Shabbos leads us into Tishaba. A friend of mine, his father was very, very sick. The doctors really had given up hope. He had gone through six years of horrible treatments, six years of amputation, six years of one Gehenim after the other, one setback after the other. And when he was up to the final, final last days, his mother was sitting next to her husband saying, kill him. And in walked the priest. And he went over to her perhaps well-intended, and said, you can't be in denial. Why are you continuing to say psalms now? Don't you realize it's all over for your husband? And she stood up and said, after thousands of years of pain and suffering of Gullus, I don't believe anything is all over. And if it doesn't help for my husband, then it'll help for someone else. And if it doesn't help for someone else, It'll help for the endurance of Klal Yisrael. And with those words, she sat down and continued her Tehillim. I noticed an interesting thing here on the streets of Melbourne. In New York, when there is a street that doesn't lead into anything, you can't go through the street anywhere else. There's a very unpleasant sign. It says, dead end. Doesn't sound very good. Especially if someone lives on a dead end street. There are even horror movies called Dead End. There are bars that are called the Dead End Bar on Dead End Streets to try to create a kind of ominous atmosphere. I noticed that over here it does not say Dead End. It says no through where it's no through something. You can't pass through. As if to say it's never dead. It's never a wall. There's nowhere to go. Some of the signs in America are also changing to no outlet for this reason. You may not be able to go through here, but it's not a dead end. It means that there's going to be something else. Even when we're up against a brick wall and there's no place to go. Shloim HaMelech teaches us, Yaakov Avinu teaches us, life goes on after the Chevron massacre. And little children were chopped and hacked to death by Arabs. And people that were sent, my Senefesh themselves, to go learn in Chevron, murdered and killed, and their blood lies over the Shtenders and the Gemaras. So that... That Friday night, the survivors of Hebron got together in Yerushalayim. And one of the Bachrim was davening for the Amid Friday night. And when he came to the words, And your love will never go away from us. He couldn't finish the words. He choked. He choked. He closed his eyes. He envisioned the hacking of his friends, the death, the pain. He couldn't say it. How could I say this words? Like, Kaddish Baruch your love will never forsake us. He wanted to run away for the Amid. But Rosh Hashiva, I think it was Rameir Chadash, told him, no, stand there. And he turned around to the Olam and said, you're right. No Yachid can rise to the level after seeing such murder and have the courage to say, Bahavascha al-Tasim imenu li'alam. But the Tzibur can help him. And the entire tzibur together started singing. Again and again they said the words. The power of Kayach of Klal Yisrael is beyond imagination. We're up against a brick wall. No explanations. Such pain, such horror. 
Noichach. I'm standing in front of a wall. I can't go weiter. That's not bad news. That's good news. Because now you know you need Pnei Hashem. They once saw the Sadegad Rebbe sweeping the streets in front of his house in Yerushalayim. I think he lived in Sanhedrin. The Rebbe sweeping the streets with a broom. What happened to the Rebbe? They went over to him. They said, we have a custodian, you know. He didn't want to say why he did it. The next morning they caught him again. The Hasidim said, Rebbe, please, what are you doing? Finally he told them the secret. He so said, when the Germans marched into his town, they marched the Rebbe in front of everyone who was lined up in the town square. And they gave the Rebbe a broom. <coughs> and they told the Rebbe to sweep the streets in front of everyone. He said, I made a nether then, that if I survive and I make it to Eretz Yisrael, I am going to sweep the streets of Eretz Yisrael. And I did. You want me now not to sweep the streets in front of my base of Medrash. But somebody who was present during that wall day, that bitter day, that day of gullis and pain, and saw the Rebbe holding the broom said, he overheard what the Rebbe said when the Germans gave him the broom. The Rebbe looked around and he said as follows, he said, Rabbi Shalayla, these Germans, they're yours. You created them. You give them life. The Goyans and Adana Goyim. He looked at the floor that he had to sweep. And he said, Rabbi Shalayla, the Ed is Dan Ed. The earth is your earth. And he looked at the broom. And he said, Rabbi Shalayla, this broom is your broom. And he looked up and said, creator of the universe if you want me because I am yours you give me life if you want your guy to tell me to sweep your street with your broom then I do so with the same ahava that I do putting on tefillin and saying Kriya Shema and he began to sing and dance to himself as he swept the streets. Do you understand now why this broom was his visa to Eretz Yisrael? Why this broom was his passport to Eretz Yisrael? Horror of horrors! The Heilige Rebbe has given a broom at gunpoint and sweep the streets. Bizyainis of Bizyainis. But if you want to see the Rabbi Nishalaylam, you can see the Rabbi Nishalaylam with that broom. And that broom becomes the magical broom that takes you, that takes you to Eretz Yisrael. And if you have a rabbin that holds themselves together with Amuna and with Kayach, then we can all say, It doesn't make a difference what the circumstances are. Yirmiyaya Navi cries, Shesam Tfilasi. My Tfilah has been blocked. The Medrash is Medayik because Tfilah is Lashin Yachid. Had he said it Lashin Rabbin, had it been Tfilah B'Tzibur, could have penetrated. Tefillah B'tzibur works. There's a young man in Yerushalayim, born and bred on Meir Sharim Street. True, didn't have much to his life. True, they slept in shifts in his house because there were 14 children in a tiny little room, which was their complete apartment. But he was the happiest child. So happy when he got married. So happy when he had his first baby. And then the baby was brought to a doctor the doctor told him he has to check something out. And it turned out that they were chayshish, that the baby had a very serious problem, a life-threatening problem. <coughs> the young man had never faced a crisis in his life, didn't quite know what to do, began to ask the askonim, ran from doctor to doctor in Eretz Yisrael. No one can help him. He was told that one of the biggest askonim in Eretz Yisrael that there is a doctor in America that could possibly help you. But he had no idea how to get to America. To him, America and Australia were all in the same continent. All he knew were the streets of Meir Sha'ari. Where would he go? How would he get there? He doesn't have a red cent to his name, never mind the insurance and the costs of the doctors. It was a mountain impossible to climb. And he kept calling this asking and that asking, and people were trying to help, but they shook their heads in disbelief this is not going to work. And one day he's in Yerushalayim and he gets a call from an Askin. 
in B'nai Brak or in Tel Aviv and says, listen to me, you're never going to believe this. That doctor that could heal your child is in my office right now. He popped in. He's going to be here for the next half hour. If you come over with your child, he'll take a look. He says, a half hour from Yishalayim to B'nai Brak, I can't. He says, you have to get over here. He grabs the child, races downstairs, flags a taxi down, dives in, says, I have to get to Yishalayim in a half hour. He says, EF Shar, impossible. He takes out 500 shkall of his life savings, gives it to the taxi driver, and the taxi driver looks at it and says, F Shar. And they drive off. And they drive off and scare half the people between Yerushalayim and Tel Aviv. Burning rubber, turning onto tires, sneaking in, police cars chasing them, nothing is stopping them, anything. He doesn't know which is a greater second, his daughter's disease or this cab ride. And he screeches to a stop, the young man is schwitzing bullets, he doesn't have a penny to his name, he gave him the last 500. He jumps out of the car, the taxi driver opens the hood, allows for the smoke to clear, races upstairs, half fainting, half alive, half dead, pounds on the door of the Askin. And the Askin says, the doctor just left. He falls to the floor, he says, give me a drink of water. Give me a drink, please, give me a drink. They come, and they give him a drink. He's about to make a shahakal. And as he says the words, Baruch Atta. Hashem, he stops short and begins to think for a moment. And he says, Rabbi Shalom, Rabbi Shalom, I can talk to you at any time. I don't need appointments with you. I don't need a skonim. I don't need insurance. I don't need dangerous cab drives. At any moment I can say, Baruch Atta Hashem, forget the doctors, forget all the people that tried to help me. Rabbi Shalom, you help me. He cried and said, Baruch Atta Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam. Shahak Eliyah you created me, you created my daughter, you created this taxi, you created this doctor, it's all yours anyway. Short while, his daughter had a remark remarkable recovery. He said it was the Shahakal that did it. His wife said it's Shahakal. You could have made a shahakal over here, we would have had 500 shkalim left to our names, and you wouldn't have scared half the people on the Tel Aviv, B'nai Yishlaim Highway. He said, there's no way in the world we could have made that shahakal over here. There are certain shahakals you could only make in your life under certain circumstances. <laughs> there are certain situations where we're up against the wall, where it looks like shasam tvilasi, where it looks like there's no place to go. And then you have a choice. You have a choice of giving up, or making a shahako like you never made before in your life. At the end of Eicha, so Yirmiyahi finishes with such nice words, Hashiveinu Hashem Elecha ben Eshuva. But then he says, Ki imoi simastonu, ketzavtu leinu ad mi'oi. So we don't want to end with something that is sad, Ki imoi simastonu. So we repeat the words of Hashiveinu Hashem Elecha ben Eshuva. I ask you a question, my friends, and many ask, are we smarter than Yirmiyahu Hanavi? Yirmiyahu Hanavi himself did not know that it's important to be Messiah in Bedover Taiv. So if he finished with the words, Ki Amois, Mastana, why don't we, why aren't we Messiah though? Why are we smarter than him? The answer is, Yirmiyahu is telling us a message. The message is, you should know, Chazdi Hashem, Kilei Samlo, Kilei Chali the message is we're going to come back. But in order to do that, you have to make a shahakal. In order to make that shahakal, you're going to come to a matzav of kiyamois, nastonu, ketzafta, leinu adnoi. I did everything and it's my last chance and the doctor just left. And if you stop Eicha at that moment, then you lost your chance. And if you have the courage to repeat the shahakal after all is lost, and you say Hashivain, only then are you Zaycha to the Geula. Yirmiyahu is warning us. In your eyes, it's going to look like now he walks out. Five minutes earlier, you have to make a Shahaka at that moment. Close the Megarov Zechat Sadiq Racha. was once hiding in a bombed out building. They were holding on to dear life, to whatever was left of the rubble and the beams that could have collapsed at any moment. The Germans were marching around downstairs with dogs barking away. 
but Rav was next to somebody else, so suddenly heaven unleashed its fury and it began to storm and pound down upon them. <coughs> Closing the Rav started saying Krishna. <coughs> they looked at him and said, at a time like this you're saying, Shema, you still believe in an Hashem? And the closing of the answered, I want to ask you something. Do you think al piderech hateva, it makes sense that we should be in such a massive? Don't you see there's a script over here? If the world was just plain hefker, it's impossible we should be in such a situation. There's a script and there's someone that's behind the script. The broom belongs to someone. There's no one that's immune. When a person faces a tragedy, Rahman al Islam, we're all kind of knocked out of our orbit. There was a whole study that was done with the tsunami and the earthquake in the Pacific with, with in Japan, that the Earth, the planet Earth, was actually knocked out of its orbit or axis for a fraction of a second. So there were scientists that wondered, you know, it went right back in. But what if it didn't slip back into place? Could have that been the end of the world? So I read a study where another scientist says, no. That he says just the opposite. That it, it has anything that turns on a constant basis has to be knocked out and put back in to continue to turn, and he explains the math about it. And of course, they see the boy in front of their eyes, but they don't notice it. In other words, even when we're knocked out of our orbit and something happens in our life that shocks us beyond our imagination and we can't believe a Kaddish Baruch who did this to us, this is also part of God's plan. This is also part of the Hashgacha. It's also part of the Hashgacha. Tisha B'Av, we're knocked out of our orbit. Can't understand what happened. No tefillin, no limit haptaira. We're knocked out of our orbit. But that's also part of God's plan. But Noichi Astir Astir says the Bashem Tev, if there's ever a moment in your life you can't believe that Kaddish Baruch Hu did this to you. So stop a moment and say that this that you can't believe that the Kaddish Baruch Hu did this to you is also part of the Ashgacha. But Noichi Astir Astir, and that's how you connect yourself to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. A woman came with Askanim to Rebel Yashiv, Zechot Tzadik Levrach, and said, he asked the Shaila, her husband was diagnosed with a terrible disease, should they or should they not go to America? The doctors in America were not interested in taking the case, they felt whatever could be done could be done there, it's if it can't be done there, it can't be done here. The Askanim said they don't think anything more could be accomplished in America, Rebel Yashiv said don't go. The woman, as she was about to leave, turned to Rabbi Yashif and said as follows. If this is the Xeris Hamakim that I should be an Almana and my children should be a Simon, I accept it. But I want to ask the Rav one thing. She bit her lips, held back her tears and said, when my children are going to grow up, they're going to ask me, did you do everything that was possible to do for Tati? Am I going to be able to answer them if I don't go to America that I did everything that is possible to do. Rebel Yashiv thought for a moment and said, go to America and go now. He told one of the Yaskanim to be misadered. It was Friday morning. He said, he'll work on it right after Shabbos. Rebel Yashiv said, I said, go now. It's Bekuach Nefesh, travel even on Shabbos. Somebody asked, Li'ibadu Mechaim L'chaim, Reb Chaim Kanievsky, how did Rebel Yashiv, how did the pendulum swing so wide? What made him change his mind? He explained he didn't change his mind. Lemaisa, the treatments in America worked. The story is many, many years ago, and this young man is now sitting in Kyle and learning. And his children didn't have to ask that question because their father was there with them. The Chaim's uptight was that once this woman said, I accept Hashem's gazelle. If this is what Hashem wants, this is what it's going to be. Just tell me what I have to do. Once she reached that level of a Munah Rebel Yashiv Taicht, that now with any Ishtablis it's going to work. The Ishtablis and the Yetzlocha was so rach examizeh, it didn't make any sense. But if she could say that with such a full heart, that whatever Hashem happens, I'm ready to accept it. I just want to know if I did my Ishtablis, if, if she's on that level of a Munah, that it can work. It's not the doctors in America that saved him. It's his wife that saved him. There are times that we are knocked out of our access. There are times that we can't believe we were forced to do things. So the Rebishtin's upheaten, although we're not chas shalom 
in that massif where that woman had to pick one child over another, but sometimes we're in situations where we have to hurt people, where we have no choice. We have an halacha made demand that we have to deal with the guilt of it. How does life go on? How does life go on? How can we deal with the Germans that did this to us? We can take every child and say this child is the greatest gift in the world and I will give my life to this child. Satmar Rav Schein once said, be careful with your children because they may be your parents. I heard from Rebellion Bev Achtfeigl from Sein Gesundheitstag. He said, but by Chorben Bayes Rishayim, all the Neshamas that were murdered and killed were the Neshamas that had Inyonim of Avodah Zara in them. And that's why right afterwards it was a pure world. So pure that the Anshe Knesset Zagdayla were able to pop in and give us the whole Kayach of Tefillah and destroy the Taiba of Avodah Zara, unbelievable things. By Bayes Shani, all those that had the Chatoim of that time were wiped out. And therefore it was such a pure world right afterwards that it was the beginning of Torah Shabbal Peh. He said, during the Holocaust, we don't know why it happened. But one thing is for sure. Right afterwards, there was a Tahara that settled on the world, as he explained it. Not chas v'shalom to suggest that the people that were killed deserve to be killed. But whatever gzerim, shemayim, whatever kitrit and cloud Yisrael, the kaparas were brought, the karbonites were accepted, and there was such a tahara that there was an unbelievable building of Torah and mitzvahs and yeshivas beyond their imagination. I had the schutz to speak to many of the people over here that their parents were from the original settlers over here. And if you think about the odds that were against them to see such, such mekayma sekdash and to see so many people over here, such moizdash, such thriving, a havas, a Torah, a havas, a Yerushimayim, out of nowhere, in a land of nowhere, on the bottom of the globe. That there's a mirror yeshiva in Yerushalayim with thousands and thousands and thousands, a lake with thousands and thousands, Cain Yerbu. Anyone that would have predicted this 70 years ago would have been told, you are mad or you have a crazy imagination. After the kapara of Bayis Rishan, there was a tahara. After the kapara of Bayis Shani, there was a tahara. After the kapara of the Holocaust, there was a tahara. But Jabal Yudeh said, I'm worried about the next generation that may not have this level, this level of Siyat HaDashmaya. Could be we're knocked out of our orbit, but our only hope is to keep on going. I want to be Messiah. The Ramah in the Sefer Teres HaOyla says that Plato, the great philosopher, met Yermiyoi Hanavi. And he asked him, why are you crying? You're crying over a building, you're a rational person, why are you crying over a building? So Yermia turned to Plato and said, ask me all your perplexing philosophical questions. And he asked him. And Yermia answered all of them. And Plato was shocked. He was scared that his book will never be published now because this guy has all the answers before him. He said, how do you know all that? And Yermia pointed to the building that was burning and said, from that building. Then he asked him a second question. He says, okay, you got me. But the building was burnt. The building is gone. What are you crying over spilled milk for? And Yermia said, that I can't tell you because you're never going to understand. What does that mean? Why couldn't he tell it to him? What does that mean that he will never understand it? A friend of mine, was going with his father in Florida, wasn't feeling well, and they passed the Holocaust Memorial. And a woman stood there and said, You believe in God after this? And he turned to the woman and said, where were you during the war? His father. She said, in Baltimore. He said to her, it's very interesting. You were in Baltimore during the war and you don't believe in God because of the Holocaust. And I was in Auschwitz and I saw God every step of the way. You saw God? He said, yeah. He said, I was shot and thrown into a pit with hundreds of bodies on top of me. Where the earth moved up and down for days. And somehow I managed to squeeze all the way through and get to the top and survive. It was clear to me God wanted me to live. There are some people that the world is in front of them like a piece of cake and they don't see the Rabbani Shalaylam. And some people look at the broom and they say, Rabbani Shalaylam, this is yours. Every person in this world will face a wall that he does not know how to pass. We'll be in a situation, but it's a fact of life where rationally speaking I have no hope. 
And some people give up. And some people make a shahak. Plato was the ultimate rationalist. To explain to Plato that our Yeshua comes when there's no rationalization. When our Piderech there's only a wall in front of us, there's nowhere to go. Plato, the philosopher, could never understand it. Never understand it. And a couple knocked by the door of Shlomo Zalman Arbor. They began to cry. He said, what's the problem? They said they were Bali Tshuva. They wanted to start a new life and get married. They went to the Rabbanut and it turned out that there was a question about her yichus. She possibly was not a kosher child. Shlomo Zalman listened to the facts and burst into tears. He said, I can't help you, but I could cry with you. And they cried together for over an hour. And at that moment, somebody came running and said, come back to the office. Someone found a car of an Argentina who came and said, Adis distorted the Adis of the person who suggested she was not kosher and led the Besan to be able to investigate that indeed she was kosher. Who saved this marriage? If Shlomo Zalman's tears saved the marriage. The Rabbi Shalom always creates the Rufua before the Maka. But the question is, can we get to that Rufua before the Maka? In order to be... <coughs> To be zaycha to the refuah that has been created prior to the Makkah, you have to be able to make a shahakal up against the wall. You have to be able to say, I, say, not say, I can't help you, goodbye. You have to stand there and cry with them. When an almona asked for Barriel Levine, Zechot Sadiq Lebrach, I cried so much for my husband, why did she die? Why did he die? He said, You think your tears are wasted? Your tears will wash away all further xeris. Little young girl in your shalayim. There's in so much pain. It's the first day of the Gan. All the little girls are being brought to the, to the Gan with their mothers. They're so excited the first day, but her mother is sick and on her deathbed. And she's sitting on the front steps crying. There's no one thinking about her. No one knows she has a new briefcase. And no one there to take her to the Gan. And the big tzaddik of Yasef Chaim Zanefeld comes by. Of Yasef Chaim Zanefeld. Busy people have time that no one else does. And he notices the little girl crying, and he says, My dear daughter, why are you crying? She says, I need someone to take me to the Gan. I want Ima to take me to the Gan. Rabbi Yasef Chaim says, I give you a bracha. I give you a bracha. That your mother should take you to your chuppah. And she stood there and she said, I, I don't understand this man. He, he doesn't know what he's talking about. What's a chuppah? I want to go to the Gan with my mother. And as the years went on, she understood what a chuppah was. She turns 26 years old. I mean, 16 years old. She's of age to become a kala in Yerushalayim. She passes every shidduch. Too big, too tall, too thick, too thin, too much money, too little money. Her husband father says, what are you doing? You have a bunch of siblings behind you with a sick mother. Let my siblings go ahead of me. Almost unheard of. All of her siblings get married before her. She's now 26 years old. She has to compromise on a shidduch. The day after the Sheva Brachas, her mother dies. She throws herself to the Arai. And she says, Mama, understand me. I had a bracha. You're going to take me to your chuppah. I wanted my siblings to have that bracha as well. And that's why I waited. <laughs> you know, we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu for so many things. The Rabbi Hashem doesn't give it to us. The Rabbi Hashem tells us something about a chuppah, about the geula, about Mashiach. What? We don't know what he's talking about. What chuppah? I want to go to the gun. What do we know? But if we understand how to make a shahakal when things aren't going your way, then we do know it. Sanza Rav once said that the first, third base of is there and it's ready to come down. The only thing that's missing is the paraychas. The Hasidim said to him, Rabbi, so hang up the paraychas. He said, I do. But I'll just keep ripping it off. If we decide that we are one unit, if we are decide that in our pain and others' pain we make a shahakal together, and the paraychus that has to be pushed to the side this night, next year, will hang in living color. And only here, in your shalayan, your akhaydesh, in the base of the